So where will we start, Douglas? 1980? Well, when did well, we meet? I think we met in 1982. Um, I'm not that old. Yeah. <laughs> I know, you were just a baby. Well, compared <laughs> I was a to, baby. If, it's funny because there's not a massive age gap, but it did feel like you were significantly younger when Norman was in between the two. I think when, we, you, when you're younger, the age gap's wider than when you get older. Yeah, definitely. If that makes sense. When, when like, Because when I was like 14, you were 16. Mm-hmm. So that age gap's always stayed, but it felt more when we were that age. Because um, I wasn't out, allowed out that late. Well, what, I, <laughs> what I sort of remember is, from from my perspective, I'd kind of hooked up with Norman because it felt like he was the only other kind of oddball and dreamer that I could find in Bell Sill. But, yeah, yeah. but then he'd found you. Yeah. And I, remember, I remember seeing him walking down the street with tartan trousers on once. I was thinking... Okay, that guy must be into the same kind of thing as me. Mm-hmm. And I think that's before. Now that's the thing about these days with social media, is people don't do that anymore. People don't search for friends in a way of just being like soulmates. Yeah, no, the, you know, because it's all instant now. You, you can find out about somebody in two seconds about mm-hmm. everything they like and every movie they like. Whatever we discovered each other over a long period of time. And yeah, but I, I mean, it's funny because I was thinking about. I remember Norman once saying in an interview I saw about Bell Sol being a dump. And, and it wasn't it wasn't the best place in the only place, but I actually I was thinking about how grateful in a funny way I am that we came from Belsol because mm. I sort of think if I hadn't come from Belsol, I probably wouldn't have found you or Norman, and we wouldn't have found each other. And I, I sort of think I'm not I'm not sure that we wouldn't have ended up doing things as individuals, but I definitely think it was a very important thing that the three of us gained some mm. sort of strength through meeting each other. And we gave each other confidence. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, when I was thinking about this coming here today, we had we kind of amused ourselves a lot of the time, to be mm-hmm. honest, because we used to have this thing where it was like if we we weren't really caring what everybody else thought as long as we got enjoyment out of it. And then when things started happening with radio and plays and interest in Glasgow, whatever, it was kind of like we were like this running this in joke that we got. Mm-hmm. That kind of, and then it kind of expanded into other things. Yeah. But at first, it was just us having. I know, and then we kind of met, but it kind of got expanded by meeting other people, like, I guess, like Francis McKee and yeah. uh, Jim McCulloch and Joe McLendon, and, and then further into meeting people like Bobby Gillespie and Steve Bassel. But initially, it was like we'd be walking through Velsal or we'd go into Glasgow and we'd sort of want to entertain, but we'd also want to irritate other people. Yeah. We'd, we'd want people to look at us and yeah. go, Who are weirdos? Yeah. I think there was a certain amount of shock value in it as well. Mm. I mean, do you remember all the bands that we used to invent that lasted about two weeks to play that? Remember, you, I still can't believe we did this. And sometimes I actually think, was this a dream? Uh-huh. But did we have a band called Child Molesters you that played My gig. School? Yeah. And the whole idea we put it together was to get banned from my school. And we didn't get banned, <laughs> we had to do the gig. And you sang a Throbbing Grizzle song yeah, on stage. Yeah, called... Um, uh, uh, I've got a little biscuit turn to keep my panties. Yeah. That's a line out of it, isn't it? Uh-huh. And it was just like... We won't. We can't possibly yeah. allow this, but we kept allowing us to do this stuff, so we just had to go further and further and further. I think I was only in fourth year, and I had to go back to school the next day after being in a band called. You would never be able to do that these days, <laughs> never. But and, and I also remember one thing we played at the Hatton Rig, and all the kind of anarchist punks kind of pick had a picket line outside sure. and tried to persuade people not to not go to and go. see the Pretty Flares because they were like too sort of deviant and too too weird. Yeah. It was a bit like oh the punks. The punks think we we are kind of like kicking against the system a bit too hard, and we should be bandy. We're like Mary Whitehouse for yeah. us. But I suppose when you think about it, the way it's spread out from Bell Hill is a bit like what people do these days with social networks. But ours was like a kind of an organic social network that slowly built over years, mm-hmm. like a kind of chain reaction. Like you met one person, then you met the other person through the other person, and this whole family got bigger and bigger. And then obviously Splash One came along that put us all under the same roof, mm-hmm. and that's where it all became. But I remember it as being you were the guy, although you were the youngest one, I, I think, I don't know if it was like that fearless quality of just being a lot bit younger, or maybe just more hunger for it in some ways, but you were the one that actually almost made the, the point of contact where it was like, I don't want to just be a, a big fish in the little pool of bells still anymore, I want to go further, and I, I think you approached people like Bobby Gillespie and well, that, Stephen that, Pastor. Well, that came things. from working in Flip. Because you remember, I, I, I 
I remember buying a baseball jacket out of Flip, and because I went into the shop one day wearing that baseball, do you remember that red baseball mm-hmm. jacket? I worked into the shop, and, they, and I'd just left school, and the guy said to me, do you want a job? And I went, yeah, and I worked there, and then Bobby came in one day, and I was playing a cassette of the Soup Dragons rehearsing, and he went, what's this? And I went, oh, it's my band. And I knew Bobby, obviously, from Jesus and Mary chain, and that's when he said, do you want to support my band Primal Scream at Splash One? And Splash One, I think that was the third Splash One, wasn't it? Because mm-hmm. we went to all of them, didn't we? Oh. And, um, and that's where the network started from there, you know, like, mm-hmm. and then the next thing, BMX Bandits played Splash One, and then Soup Dragons played again, and then the BMX Bandits played again. And, and I think Norman had almost at one point, it's funny, when we both started having kind of that level of interest and success, none of the things we'd done before it had, it was almost like Norman had taken a wee break at first, and then I think mm-hmm. he was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Both be big bandits and the Soup Dragons have got records coming out. I'm missing out here, I'm getting back into this. And then he started the Boy Hairdressers. And the first Boy Hairdressers, yeah, the boy hairdressers that's right, yeah. was Norman, you and I. That, that was who played on the first the first demo. We was recorded it? a version of um, Tidal Wave and I was oh, slapping my legs. Yeah. And you were playing, I'm not sure what, you might be playing keys Are or multiple instruments. Are they being the most Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you were gay. Um, my my, I, I was either kazoo oh, or slapping knees. About that. So yeah, that was the first boy hairdressers thing. Was just the three of us. What? And then that became a group, and then that uh, boy hairdresser guest morphed into teenage fan club. The boy hairdressers didn't last very long, did they? No, but they had a lot more material. Yeah. Than, and some of it, I think, ended up. The later stuff that was never recorded ended up becoming the early teenage, teenage fan, club. fan club. Yeah, I remember the first time Norman said the name of the band was the Teenage Fan Club. I just thought it was genius. It is a great name. It is a great name. But I mean, it was a, not a standoff with Teenage Fandango or something. There was all these kind of like different kind of well, variations. One, one time I think they teenage were... Fanny. One time they were going to go for Teenage Fanny. Yeah, and, that's like um, Teenage Fanny. But I think they just thought maybe that'll be a bit too controversial. Was that a t-shirt? I'm a Teenage Fanny. Yeah, was, or a was, badge or something. Was, yeah, was it was some, it was yeah, some yeah, school yeah. teacher who was a big fan of Teenage Fan Club. I remember him going to his work wearing um, a badge that said, I'm a Teenage Fanny, yeah. and then um, getting hauled over the coals for it. So you think about it, well, even all that kind of, um, doing all that stuff kind of goes right back to the child molesters. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of <laughs> idea of just like, being so outrageous that you, you'll never get away with it, and then actually, oh shit, we did get away with it, and we had to do it. And all oh, that gigs, I, I dream about that sometimes because it's like sometimes I'm like I've told people about it and I've said I actually don't know if it happened because I don't know if it was just a dream, but it did happen, did it? Yeah, yeah it did happen. But the thing is, the other thing is, people were really really shocked when we sang things like cute things and totally non-offensive things. Like I'd be eating a banana on stage and people would be offended by that, yeah. or you know, the, or the fact that you know. Some of us would have anoraks with like lovely floral patterns on them. People would go, "I want to kill you because you're wearing the anorak <laughs> with flowers on it." It was uh It wasn't like um, we were doing anything. What was it? Like a, was it another band called What Katie Did? That was some band. But I don't know who that who that was. That was either. definitely on stage for that. There was even a point where I kind of was being on the cassettes but not on stage. That was a oh. period, wasn't it? Where it was like, yeah. I was too shy to go on stage. So I would record everything on a cassette and you all got on stage and then play the cassette oh. as the background. We could dance about and, yeah. and, and, and be silly. Because the first time I actually sang down a mic, live, loud, was at Splash One, supporting Primal Scream. Like those five songs. Because right. in rehearsals with the Soup Dragons, I never really sang out down the mic. Well, Norman was the same. It's funny because I, I was a, a sort of natural show off. And I'll, although I'm quite shy in some ways, I was naturally, because when we went busking, I would be the main singer and things. And I was probably the least gifted of the three of us technically as a as a singer or as a vocalist. But um, I think it was just I, I'd um, always been a little bit of a show off as a kid and things. So I had that kind of very natural chops. Well, I got, what I got from, or one of the many things I got from you and Norman, apart from just the reassurance and the strength, was the fact that you guys had a lot of kind of musical chops and kind of were quite, even then, compared to a lot of bands around us, I think we, we the three of us were all musically quite ambitious. We yeah. kind of, yeah. with bigger pictures in our mind. We may have started off in some that's quite primitive, but I think we always had this idea of mm. taking it to another point. I think I've always been a bit of a producer. And I've only realised that re- till recently, that all the way through my life, I wasn't really 100% just a band member, I was a producer as well. Yeah. I've always thought of music 
as a whole. Yeah, you I always remember, like it about sound. Yeah, and I always remember like even like always remember Strawberry Sunday with you is that you could actually sing a song finished. So you'd say to me, "Can you work out what these chords are?" You know, and because you wrote that song, but I had to work out what all the chords were. It went with it, but you actually sang it pitch perfect to where you'd actually be able to work out chords. And that's a gift as well, being able to do that. Because I wouldn't be able to do that. I wouldn't be able to write a melody of a song yeah, like that. I have I to write a song dream, music. I sort of dream of the band playing in my head, I guess. But yeah, it's funny because, yeah, Norman had great songwriting and musical chops. And you definitely always had this kind of vision of sound. And I guess that kind of Soup Dragons records compared to what a lot... Of it, it went from being a kind of primitive thing to being mm. something that was a much more grand or bigger kind of type of pop music? That's because we were always kind of being able to like experiment more as time went on. And I suppose in the early days of going into, what was the name of the studio that used to be just down there? Was it, was it Cent 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 City Sounds? Centre City Sounds. Do you remember like the rehearsal room used to have the drum, the drum kit, the drum riser was on a tyre, mm -hmm. a big tyre, and it moved about when the drummer played drums. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, we recorded our first single there for thirty-three pounds. I remember, I remember it being thirty-three pounds because the flexi disc cost something like sixty-six. So the whole thing came to under a hundred pounds. I've just thought about another thing that's a bizarre memory is the first two things that you released. I think were the Super Dragons flexi disc and then the Beam Expanders debut single. Yeah. And one of them got a review from one music people saying. This is possibly the best single of all time. And the other one, about two weeks later, got this is possibly the worst record ever. And I was just wondering, can you remember how any kind of reaction you had to those two reviews and what they made you think? I was kind of shocked because yours was a flexi disc. And I was told it's actually the only flexi disc that got single in the week of NME ever. I would imagine. And, that. Um, and it's funny because I've been talking to Neil Taylor about it recently because it was Neil Taylor that, that wrote it. And we were reminiscing over the, if you remember the first Soup Dragons thing in A&ME, mm -hmm. which was like, we were like, went from nothing to having five pages. It was like huge. It was like over like, well, it was three, was it four pages? Yeah, because it was it like was a, a big, double, big double spread mm -hmm. with loads of pictures. And you went from nothing to that. And I remember going down to London with Norman mm -hmm. and, and we had to get the overnight bus because it was the cheapest possible way to do it. And we got chicken pox. I remember that. And we went down and we an interview. Neil Taylor, Neil Taylor told me a few months ago that we actually, actually we gave him chicken pox because right. he didn't know. I said, did, did you ever get chicken pox? He goes, well, yeah, when you left, I got chicken pox. I went, oh, that was us that gave you it. <laughs> <laughs> and then when we got back in the bus going back, me and Norman were like, that was throwing up and things in the bus going back. And mm -hmm. that was us. We had chicken. I think we gave everybody it. Did you know? We all well, came I, back did, I didn't get it, but Norman was like me. He's like, oh, I've had it before. I can't get it. Yeah, I had it before as well. And I got it again. But you both yeah, got it bad. Yeah. Somehow yeah. I, I, I was strong enough. So I always associate that, that big Soup Dragons piece with chicken pox. And it's funny now talking, because Neil Taylor's doing a book, and we were talking about it, and he went, I've never known all these years that it was used to, it gave me the chicken pox. It's so bizarre, but because the Soup Dragons definitely for a while, and I mean then, of course, you get the opposite, because they were so contrary to these papers. You, you were like the most loved band by, I think, that the enemy yeah, three music that sort of purpose, yeah, yeah, at that yeah. point. But then when you actually have a hit record off your own back, not following what they want you to follow, that's when it all yeah, they turn goes drastically you wrong, you know, because it's it's all about um, control. Mm -hmm. And and luckily that doesn't happen these days now. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no control over um, over scenes. You know, we almost had the opposite. Everybody hated us until we made serious drugs. Well, all the critics yeah. hated us. Then we made serious drugs, and then suddenly there was all these writers who were fans of us, and you're going, no, you all hated us. <laughs> and I sort of quite liked it when he hated us. I liked when the enemy were the enemy. Uh, yeah. But it all kind of came round in a big circle for us, because when the Soup Dragons split up, and there was years, and then I did the High Fidelity. The first single I put out with the High Fidelity was on that Japanese label, Vinyl Japan, mm -hmm. as a small seven inch, and he made it single a week again, it all started again. <laughs> it was just this exactly. whole big circle again. Do you remember the kind of, because you, you guys had had your sort of like big impact and then, and that never really, it wasn't a moment of big impact really ever for me, Mix Bandits, but then Norman had it, I guess, with Start the Teenage Fan Club. And I guess when that happened, in, I remember, I think you took them either in tour 
Or do you yeah, certainly, it's, certainly it's fan club came in tour was support the Super Dragons. For like it was like when Nine Free came out and it all became mad and big. Um, it was uh, it was like a three week tour or something. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was like Barrowlands and not bad. Yeah, it was a Barrowlands and Brixton Academy and all these places. Do you have memories of what that? Because I guess it's that thing of you and Norman starting that journey together and then suddenly. You're, well, he's in this band who are beginning to catch fire, and you guys have like become a kind of a chat act, you know. There was a lot of drink involved. I remember that because everybody was just like constantly like having a good time, and um, it was lots of mixed emotions because it's a bit it's a bit weird taking it all in when something like that happens, especially when you've been in a band that's been going for so many years, and then suddenly it's just like one record changes everything. And changes everything for a good way and then changes everything for a bad way as well. So there's two sides to it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, people's kind of perceptions to you totally change. Why? Yeah, because a lot of people, they, 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 they love you, but when you become a little bit too successful for their liking, they start to... Mm -hmm. not I think we did the it. best thing we could have done then was just decide to go to America for a long time mm -hmm. and get away from it all, which I thought was the best thing we could do. And travel about and see places. But um, I also kind of regret that. We should have just, uh, you know, not do that. But um, that was the same with, like, Norman. Norman had a lot of success with the fan club in America as well around that time. Mm. And you guys as well, when the whole Nirvana thing broke. Yeah, I know. I mean, ours was always in a slightly lower, slow burning <laughs> level, but... Uh... So where did, you, like, your first... Um, experience of hearing of Lurvan and Kurt Cobain come into the whole thing? Well, I got told that, I think it was Calvin Johnson who was in Beat Happening and what on 53rd and 3rd had, uh, Kurt had a K Records, which was Calvin's label, Tattoo in his arm. Mm. I think a lot of people thought the K was for Kurt and he was a big fan of that and I think Calvin just being a wee bit older was like, you should check out these records, you know, these really mm. cool records that are coming out in Scotland. And I think, to be honest, I think Kurt, the, the band that excited the most was the Vaselines. Mm. But he, then he heard Teenage Fan Club and he really liked that. And he's kind of been quoted as saying uh, in a radio interview that if he could have been in any other band, it would have been BMX Bandits. But where, where did that quote come from? It's, it was a, a, an interview on New York Radio. Really? Yeah. And, um, but I think my... What, what I think of that is... I'm not meaning I don't think he liked any of the records, but I think... Eugene had been in BMX Bandits and Norman had been in BMX Bandits and he loved the guys mm. so much and their band so much and he'd heard both of them saying the most fun I've ever had making music mm. was when I was in BMX Bandits and he probably thought the guys were just able to stand in the back and play the guitar and mm. the pressure wasn't on them. Yeah, well, so that sounds like the kind of band maybe I would like to be in. That's what I like doing that. <laughs> well it is, it's a, different, it's, a, it's, a, but it's a different thing and I, I can imagine at that time he was just so much under the lens, because like, you. if I could have been in BMX Bands, I could have just been having fun and be hanging out with guys who are into similar things. It's, mm. But um, yeah, I mean, I guess yeah, teenage fan clubs uh, were on the last European tour with him, and you know he covered all his songs of of Eugene's. And as you'll remember, like, well, obviously we'd been in a band with Francis with, with, with the Pretty Flowers, but maybe about twenty people were interested in the Vaselines mm. in Glasgow, total. Mm. And nobody was interested in them. We were, so, we were like their fans. Mm, God like yeah, us and Stephen yeah. and Jim Lambie were sort of... Used to always go to their gigs. But great gigs. it was like most people just did not get them at that mm. time. And then, you know, thankfully, yeah, time changed that. Yeah, yeah. And Francis, of course, was exactly the same in the sort of Pretty Flowers. We, it was the guys in the band too were the kind of sweet ones that did. I'm not meaning Frances isn't sweet, but she would always, even then, she'd have that really dirty mouth and kind of be, you know, saying really inappropriate things. Uh, well, you know, like Eugene would maybe shy away from doing that quite a lot and uh, she'd be the one that would say something completely outrageous and still does. I always loved the fact that the first Vaseline's 12 inch has a divine cover oh, on the B-side because there's something, something really twisted about this band it's associated with these being a kind of noisy punky guitar band I actually done this high energy track in a very high energy way mm -hmm. on the B-side I know that's funny because apart from the music there was these kind of things like films and art references mm. that we all got yeah. and some of us would beam 
more passionate fans about certain things than other things. Mm. But like, yeah, the John Waters thing, the Divine thing. Yeah. I yeah. always remember all of us being. I remember you being a particularly big fan. I'm a bit of a set obsessive. Um, and oh. Eugene's brother Charlie Kelly, yeah. who was in the drummer in the, the Vaseline's as mm. well, was like that. And, and Stephen, I think, was a big fan of it as well. And so when, we, I, when we, I wrote Divine Thing. Um, we tried to get John Waters to do the video and then he decided he was going to do the single after that called Pleasure and it was all going, it was all happening and I'd spoke to people on the phone and all this and then Serial Mum came out and became really big as you know, really yeah. quick and he had to say no I can't do it, I'm too busy Timing all those years but He's a killer I always absolutely adore, I, I adore John Waters' sense of aesthetic to everything in the sense of mischief, again, I think, as you yes, were saying earlier, yeah. as the sense of mischief, I think we still sort of got us as a sense of mischief of the things oh, we God, do. Yeah, push, you, push the aesthetic, you push the envelope, you know, thinking outside the box is the fun thing, confusing people. And mm -hmm. um, I think we've always went out our way to try and confuse, mm -hmm. even right down to the artwork of some things. I mean, that first BMX Bandits cover, which is kind of funny now, because tonight we're playing the gig at the CCA, That's and that poster to. looks like an absolute genius piece of art. But actually, it was like, I mean, not putting it, putting it down or anything, <laughs> but it was thrown together in the kitchen, yeah. and we were rolling about because it was so bad. We were laughing at it, going like, stick your face in a star. <laughs> and it was it looks so bad, you know? The star like, was basically, we bought the Seek Seek Sputnik single. Oh, God, yes, right. And it yes, was like, yes, we, didn't, six, we maybe didn't you cut, totally you, love it. You cut so we shape cut out it. the star from the Six Seeds Butnik single, coloured it, in, coloured it in red, and you and I went up to the photo booth in the uh, post cop, office in Bell uh, took a photograph and stuck my face in it. I went, that'll be a good cover. I remember, like, do you remember that first Soup Dragon single? It never came out mm. because it was cut so badly. I remember Ross, you know, Ross used to do the mm. artwork, being the artist. And he, because in those days you had to do it with letter set and, mm -hmm. and you had to like layer it up so all the Perspex layers would be printed properly. But somehow when it got sent to Bristol, it all moved about in the post. So you got the first cover back and everything was all over the place. To this day, people think that's the way we made that cover. Why? And that was the reason, I remember getting it going like, oh, what's up to our cover? People, people looking and going, this is brilliant, I love the way it's all skewed and then, and then Whole Wide World came out and I spelt surprise wrong in the back on letter set. It says, pleasantly surprised. <laughs> but like, it's like, those are all kind of like, you know, rock and roll myths now. Yeah, 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 it was meant to be surprised. Yeah, or, that's a message. Or it's, meant, it's, or it's like that BMX, I mean, that BMX Bandits cover when I saw it blown up when you were standing mm. next to the poster, I was just like so proud of that. I was just like, wow, it was like an amazing piece of you know, like rock and roll history or something. I know, and it's like, it was you and I thinking Eating how... cheese and toast and cutting things out other people's record covers. I don't want to giggle and go, oh, when people see this, will think it's the worst record cover really, of all time. It was really funny because the back cover's my handwriting. Because I remember I used to have this kind of when I was like younger, I had this, I don't write like that at all now, but my handwriting is so weird on that, but like, I wrote everybody's names and what mm -hmm. they did. And it was wrote in a pen on Perspex to put on top. Yeah, no. I, and thinking of the name, the BMX Bandits, like sat in your kitchen. Yeah, again, a lot was done in your kitchen. Mm -hmm, it was basically choice, your kitchen post. and Norman's grand's house. Mm -hmm. That was our life. Yeah. Like Norman's grand's bedroom and your kit. Well, our second bedroom and a, a, your kitchen. Uh huh. We never went back to mine because my mum was a bit of a weirdo, but we kind of kind of. Bedtime between you two. And then remember them, that person got killed in Bell Cell mm -hmm. and we got pulled into it because they see they kept seeing us moving about between there was like Bell Cell Main Street was between our two areas. Mm -hmm. So we always floated about late at night between Bell Cell Main Street and then sadly that person got their head cut off like by the train station mm -hmm. and we all got interrogated because they were all thinking, Wow, you know, these guys seem a bit dodgy. These guys seem a bit dodgy that they move about all the time. <laughs> yeah. I mean the other thing that I, 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 I remember when we thought of the name is I remember us for some reason phoning up Eugene and the two of us being giggling on the phone going, we've got a name for our new band. We're going to call it BMX Bandits, what do you think? And Eugene's like, that is maybe the worst name I have ever heard in my but life. It's genius. And we were like, yeah, I don't think it's he even genius. said it's genius. I think he just went, that's the worst name I've ever heard. And we were like, okay, we're keeping it. And then he ended up being in the band years later. It's funny thing about it. I remember it was, because you knew, the, I never even knew it was a movie at first. I just thought it was like literally the crassest name I'd ever heard when you said it. I was just like, it has to be called that. That's fantastic. That's genius. And I'd never been on a bicycle. I still never have. And it's like Soup Dragon. I remember like the Soup Dragons. I had to come up with a name because we had a gig. Because mm -hmm. we didn't really have a name before that first gig. 
and it was really it was the pressure was on because the shield was doing the artwork or something mm -hmm. it was like you have to have a name and it was like jesus i could not think of a name and i remember the names that were before that which i like not to say but um I remember coming up with a suit I, I, and people to this day think I'm some mad clangers obsessive or something and it's not, it was just a name that came up with. Yeah, and I do love the clangers. But yeah, I do love the clangers, <laughs> but no, but it's that kind of thing yeah. where, where... People it, buy more in, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, and, and especially when you went to America, because it's like, you know, nobody had a clue where that yeah. name came from, so it had a totally different meaning. Mm -hmm. I remember once getting dragged to a Chinese restaurant by the record company to do an interview because they had dragon soup wow. in this menu. And I had to do an interview in this Chinese takeaway. And I'm like, why am I here? And we're like, because that's where your name comes from. <laughs> I was like, it's not where the name comes from. I used to like say to people, the name comes from a cartoon about um, animals that live in the moon and, you know, they make blue string soup and eat it and fly through space in a musical spaceship. And you would just see this kind of blank expression on people's like, faces. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is there any serious bits you'd like to say? Because we were just having a bit of a laugh there. Um, I mean, I think we started off sort of saying that thing of being lucky to find each other and stuff. Yeah, I'd know. like to talk more about that. I mean, when, when you're still running. Um, I think we're all, we were also, the three of us, were very confused people at school as well. I mean, I know for me personally, school wasn't my happiest time because I got to a certain age where I realised that being academic was not really for me. I had a lot more going on in my head. and suddenly connecting with people who were in the same kind of space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because my mum and dad used to blame you. And then, you know, and then Norman's mum and dad used to blame me. And then, you know, they all blamed mm -hmm. each other. He was like, well, stop hanging around. My mum and dad like, liked you all. <laughs> you know, my, my mum and dad liked you all, but they were kind <laughs> yeah. of like that. They're, oh, they're the reason that you're not doing this and mm -hmm. you're, you're doing that. You know, it wasn't until you had a record in the charts and went, look, you're mm -hmm. like, oh, that's okay now. But it was all those years where we were kind of just bumming around, like having a good laugh and mm -hmm. making music and and then, and I don't think it ever kind of really became, I mean like, we even, I still, this is another one, do you remember going down to do a Janice Long session for the BBC and we didn't even have a drum kit so we played yeah. the floor. Yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> we I, I, didn't I, I, care about it, we didn't care, it was like, like, oh shit, we've not got a drum kit, we, we were just like, yeah, we'll just play the floor. The only instruments we took with us was Jim McCullough's guitar yeah. and some kazoos yeah. and everything else, we found an old rusty bass yeah. We they made Willie play the floor with two drumsticks. And you, you, and I remember I the think guy. You played the, the floor as yeah, well. Yeah, I played it as well. But I remember the guy, the, the engineer, was like, "What?" I was like, "Can you just make the floor up and we'll play the floor?" You don't have a drum kit, nah. I know. When we arrived, he was like, "So are you going to bring your gear in?" We're like, "We we'll haven't got any gear. We got, we've got this guitar <laughs> and some kazoos." And he's like, "Right, this is a Radio One session. It's like your debut." Yeah. Um, but what songs are you going to? Do? We haven't 100 percent decided. We're still writing them. I think we're going to find out what's lying around the studio and we'll uh, use that. Uh, but that was kind of yeah, that it was, was fun. A great session. Yeah, that was probably that was the best Beatles band at radio session. I would yeah, say. I remember with um, the Soup Dragons, we'd done so many John Peel sessions that we thought would be smart. And remember the one we'd done all the cover versions. Mm -hmm. We all chose a cover version each, but so she chose a Red Creole song. It was two seconds long, and it kind of goes jing. Uh -huh. Was it listen to this or something? Yeah, it's, it's called, it's listen, called, uh, I think it's called, called listen to this. Yeah, yeah and it goes, listen to this. And um, we all thought John Peel would like totally get it. And he played it and went, uh huh. And then he gave us a whole session after that. Yeah. He, he said to me, the after, he told, said to me years and years later that he said, you know, yeah, I kind of see what you were doing, but you have to remember a lot of people would have liked that airtime. Mm -hmm. And you kind of took the piss a bit by making it two seconds long where you could have gave those four minutes to some other band. We were like, okay, fair enough. But at the time it was hilarious. Right. There's just this reaction because he doesn't actually ever listen to them. Remember that mm -hmm. he used to listen to them live on air, so he didn't know what was about to happen. Which is a nice way to do it, actually, because then you get his genuine reaction. And that time, unfortunately, he was appalled. <laughs> I mean, he was appalled. But well, that was an amazing thing when that all started. When John Peel picked up on us, and um, Janice Long picked up on you, and it was like it was like you know the B Mix Bandits with Janice Long and the Ship Dragons with John Peel. And it was like we were going down to London. Well, I was kind of like mm -hmm. between the two bands all the time. And I, I mean, because Janice Long went over the top about E102. Oh yeah, you know, she, was, 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 she had a massive in, uh, argument with uh, Neil Tennant and Nick Hayward on it lasted about twenty minutes long about how great E102 was, and he didn't believe her on on the radio. Yeah. <laughs> So um, yeah, she was a she was a big supporter, yeah. and I think that that really helped as well in those days. Like suddenly, 
thinking that what we were doing in our bedrooms was getting played all over the radio. It's kind of mad to think about it because now, you know, making records like we do now, you actually realise how hard it is to get things on radio and mm -hmm. things played on us and how lucky we were back then. We mm -hmm. were just like, you know, playing, biking up floors and playing it with drumsticks and we were all over radio. And kind of making up as we went along. But, yeah. we, but we, it wasn't like we didn't care about it. We did really believe, we believed, yeah. I think we believed yeah. it was really important, but we were kind of fearless. Fearless, yeah. And we were kind of creatively insane. And not a bit naughty, mischievous. Yeah, we were mischievous. It was it was there was there wasn't a lot of in jokes between us mm -hmm. where it was like, Can we get away with this? Well, <laughs> well let's yes see. we can. Let's, let's see. see if you can get away with this. But uh good times. Lots of great memories. Mm -hmm. Lots of great memories.